Buddy, we are ready to start, and we're going to start off with Dr. Sharkey talking a little bit about February 2018. Good morning. We have a special um, our grand rounds this morning with our three visiting scholars going to present uh, what they're going to uh, be uh, dis on display at the uh, American College of Cardiology meeting coming up in March. But before that, I just want to spend a moment and highlight a few items. Uh, back on uh, two, weeks, two weeks ago on a Saturday, there was a wonderful <clears throat> 5K run around Lake Nokomis, which the Heart Institute Foundation sponsored, and many of you uh, were in the room and, and were, were there, including Dr. Nakura and his dog, <laughs> who uh, braved the below zero weather. Um, so we, we appreciate that. The, uh, the, uh, next, the latest uh, edition of the Foundation's journal is now available. If anybody wants a copy, it's available over at the Foundation. Pick up one. Uh, we, we congratulate Dr. Romero and Kelly Wilson for enrolling in a Bentavoid study, which is a new study to try and keep people off a ventilator using a novel technique. And the Radiance Trio study is uh, com uh, completed enrollment in the, the first study arm. And a special uh, note out to Alex Campbell, who's the first author on a new publication in the American Heart Journal called Resource Utilization and Outcome Among Patients with Selective versus Non-Selective Troponin Testing. And I just point out that the second author, Alexander Rodriguez, is a, a former intern with us and is now at uh, Northwestern University in Chicago and wants to go into cardiology upon his completion of medical school. So with that, I'll, I'll invite my colleague, Dr. Berlakis, to introduce the first speaker. Manos? Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Peter Tidy, who's been our scholar in the Center for Complex Coronary Interventions for the last, uh, actually, over a year. He is from uh, Hungary, from Zeged, and Zeged is a city that is south of Budapest. Actually, that's where the action is. I was there last year uh, in an amazing course they put together for CTOs, and they have an amazing volume, probably the most experienced center in the country and one of the best uh, CTO centers in uh, Hungary. So Dr. Tidy, he uh, trained uh, at the University of Zeged. He finished his medical degree a couple of years ago with uh, Kumas from Laude, and he got one of the highest awards, which is the uh, Republic Award for his last year fellowship. He's done a tremendous job uh, in the last um, uh, year, year and a half, uh, in the Progress CTO Registry, which is a registry of CTO interventions, on which he's going to talk to you today. Peter. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and I would like to say thank you for Dr. Sharkey uh, for the invitation and, of course, for the foundation of, for being here today. So on behalf of the Progress CTO investigators, I would like to give you a short uh, insight uh, from our latest results uh, of the registry that Dr. Black has mentioned. These are going to be my presentation at ACC, but due to the time limitation, I will just present the overall update of, uh, of the registry results, and I would like to uh, speak about, sorry, speak about um, CTO-PCI in patients with prior bypass surgery. First of all, I would like to introduce a case of a patient who, who is a 59-year-old uh, young guy, and uh, uh, due to severe angina, he, has, uh, he had underwent multiple bypass surgeries and two failed CTO PCIs of the distal right coronary, uh, distal right coronary artery just at the site of the anastomosis. So in the last panel, you can see a triple root injection and on the right panel, you can see uh, actually how um, retrograde wire crossed the cephal collateral. However, um, we were unable uh, to just follow it with the microcatheter. So we moved to another collateral, which is, uh, which is an epicardial collateral that you can see here. Very tortuous, but finally we were able to uh, reach the distal cap of the occlusion uh, with the CO3 uh, guide wire. And you are about to just see it right here and uh, just understand how tortuous that course of the wire will be. This crosses just right now with that loop and finally reaches the distal cap. Just, just right now. So uh, finally, people are able to uh, recanalize 
uh, the occlusion retrograde, and on the right panel you can see um, uh, final results. On the next follow-up, uh, the patient uh, gave Dr. Bilakis this uh, very kind uh, card gesture, and I will let you to just read this uh, this letter, and you will be able to understand how grateful these patients can be and how important it is to, to undergo this procedure. So the Progress CTO Registry is a large uh, international multi-center CTO registry with particip participating sites, mostly from the United States, but uh, also from uh, Europe and also from Russia. To date, uh, over 3,700 patients enrolled uh, to our registry. We are using the hybrid algorithm, which is a dedicated method, strategy, for uh, CTO revascularization. Based upon four anatomic features, uh, the operators can decide whether to go antegrade or retrograde technique and whether to use bioescalation or dissection reentry strategies. My first presentation is the overall outcome of our registry. Uh, in this uh, analysis, we included 3,055 patients with 3,122 lesions from 20 centers, uh, mostly from the United States and we classified them according to technical success or technical failure. Patients with um, technical success were less likely to be younger, were less likely to be female, and less likely to have hypertension. Also, they were less likely to be associated with uh, history of prior myocardial infarction, prior heart failure, prior cabbage. Also, they had lower, uh, I mean, sorry, higher ejection fraction and better kidney function. Patients with failed CTO PCI were more likely to have longer CTO lesions and more complex lesions based upon the proximal cap ambiguity or the lack of proximal stunt. And also, these patients were associated with higher GCTO score, progress CTO score, and progress complication score, which is used to evaluate pre-procedural uh, success rate and complication rate. The initial crossing strategy and crossing success was ranged between 53% and 61%, but using multiple strategies um, has helped us to achieve a final 87% technical success. Use of the undergrade dissection reentry technique and use of the retrograde technique was more common in patients with uh, complex lesions based upon the GCTO score, but not based upon the progress CTO score. Patients with uh, technical and procedural success had higher rate, uh, sorry, lower procedural time, required lower uh, contrast volume, fluoroscopy time, and radiation dose. And also, very important, that retrograde CTO PCI was associated with higher in-hospital major complication rates, mostly driven by in-hospital mortality and higher in-hospital uh, in procedure-related acute myocardial infarction, and also these patients had higher perforation rates. Least but not last, uh, annual CTO PCI volume was associated with a uh, higher procedural success rate in multivariable analysis. You can see it over here in the second row. So I would like to move to my next topic, which is CTO PCI in patients with prior bypass surgery. Prevalence, uh, I'm sorry, incidence of, uh, of bypass surgery in patients was 33%, which is way higher than any other population in the world compared to Japanese or European studies. Patients with prior bypass surgery we're, less likely, we're more likely to be older, more symptomatic, and more likely to be referred uh, for CTO PCI due to uh, acute coronary syndrome. Also, these patients with, were associated with um, history of prior myocardial infarction, heart failure, prior valve surgery or any procedure, prior PCI, 
also with lower left ventricular ejection fraction and lower, um, I mean, burst kidney function. The target vessel is listed here. I would like to highlight that due to the limb patency, uh, CTO target vessel as an LAD was less likely to, uh, to occur. Uh, however, um, the circumflex was uh, way more higher in the prior cabbage group, which is uh, associated with uh, reverse outcome due to the progress CTO score as well. As an evidence of higher lesion complexity, these lesions um, had more proximal cap ambiguity and less likely to have any proximal uh, stumps. And also, these lesions had higher GCTO score and progress CTO score, and also progress complication score. These lesions tend to be more resistant because balloon uncrossable lesions and balloon undilatable lesions were significantly higher in the prior cabbage group, and also these patients required more femoral approach to provide better guide support. Retrograde technique was used more frequently in the patient with prior uh, bypass surgery, as you can see here, and also it was more uh, efficient in crushing the lesion. Patients, undergoing, patients who underwent prior bypass surgery were less likely to have procedural success and technical success, and also these procedures required higher radiation dose and higher contrast volume. In hospital, uh, major complications proved to be similar between the two groups. However, I would like to highlight that prior bypass surgery uh, patients had higher rates of perforation, but less likely to have tamponade, and did not even have any pericardial synthesis in our registry, and they, have, they had higher in hospital mortality. In conclusion, I would like to say that CTO-PCI with using the hybrid algorithm has high procedural success with reasonably low in-hospital complication rate, despite the relatively low initial success rate. Higher annual CTO-PCI volume is associated with high procedural success, and prior cabbage patients are associated with lower procedural success and higher in-hospital mortality. Also, immediate treatment of coronary perforation in prior cabbage patients may result uh, in lower, with lower in-hospital mortality. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Do you think the higher perforation rate and yet lower uh, mortality from uh, bypass patients has to do with how hard you push? In other words, you know that it's probably not going to have tamponade because of prior adhesions, and so, and it's more difficult, so you just push harder. Um, so. The retrograde approach uh, was higher in these patients. Also, the undergrade, use of undergrade isoxual reentry technique was higher in these patients, which probably caused the higher perforation rate. Because whenever you are going to the subintimal phase, subintimal space, you're gonna, of course, you're gonna probably you're gonna cross to to perforate the vessel because of using the, the subintimal space. Probably that should be the, the cause for higher perforation. However, that due to prior studies, it, is, uh, it was believed that these patients, because of the pericardial adhesion, they were less likely to have pericardial tamponade, which of course is proven by our results. But immediate treatment should be very important in such patients, because even if you don't do any pericardial synthesis because you believe that loculated effusion will just sealed by its own, uh, probably, you know, you're going to have more mortality because that loculated hematoma can cause any, you know, chamber or um, atrium uh, uh, compression. And probably that's going to result. There are some publication in it, and our results me, you know, suggest this. Nice job, Peter. I just have a quick question on the bypass graft patients. Why the circumflex, um, in your opinion? Uh, so the circumflex is, uh, usually has a proximal tortuosity, because whenever you go from the left lane, you're going to, I mean, so why, 
why is this more common in prior bypass surgery patients? Uh, well, as I said, the limb of patency is uh, maybe responsible for the higher rate of using the LED, of, of, uh, of not treating the LED, because the lima usually remains patent. However, in those patients, even if it's a bypass vessel or not a bypass vessel, the circumflex were less likely to undergo CTO intervention because, uh, because even if it was bypassed with, a, with an SVG graft uh, or not, it may have uh, you know, more relevance to, to recanalize it rather than the LED. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to our next speaker. In the name of uh, Paul and the Vascular Science, uh, Valvular Science Center, uh, and Vascular, sure. Paul is not here, I believe, but Paul was integral, uh, integral. Oh, there he is. Do you want to do it then? No. Um, was an integral in, in getting the scholar here to our advanced science center, obviously. And we are proud to, to have the first scholars uh, this year. One of them is staying two years, maybe both of them, actually. Um, I just wanted to point out um, that I'm standing here is, is also a sign of diversity. A Greek introduced a Hungarian then followed by a German introducing a Japanese and Chinese scholar, and later the German is doing Watchmen's with the Jordanian. Pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. So um, I have to read this up because most of uh, the things I can't remember so quickly. But um, Hiro, or Hiroki Nikura, yes, yes. Um, is an interventional cardiologist from Japan, and he's joining us from the Toho University in Tokyo. And what uh, Hiro was doing is to look into the impact of actually creating a, a very complex mitral valve center of treatment. So what does it mean if you really create a center that is comprehensive in treating mitral valve disease? What does it mean on surgical volumes, outcomes, and potentially if we get them um, financial data as well? So welcome, and thank you for your hard work, and no, congratulations no. to your presentation. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for a nice introduction, Dr. Mario. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Hiroki Nikura. I'm from Japan. I am a research scholar in the Valve Science Center. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk at uh, this grand round. Today, I'd like to talk about my project entitled The Impact of the com com Commercial Introduction of Transcaster Mitral Valve Repair on Mitral Surgical Practice. First, let me talk about the background of this uh, uh, study. As you know, mitral regurgitation is the most common valvular region in the Western world. And surgical mitral treatment with the mitral repair or valve re replacement is the standard of care for patients with symptomatic severe MR. In 2013, the commercial introduction of mitral clip was approved in the US. However, the effect of mitral clip on mitral surgical practice was unknown. So the purpose of this study is to examine the impact of the commercial introduction of mitral clip on mitral surgical practice in a tertiary referral center. We collected all the patients who underwent mitral clip or mitral surgery treatment at our hospital from January 2012 to December 2016. This time period was to chosen, was to, uh, sorry, uh, this time schedule uh, was chosen to examine uh, surgical procedure prior to and following the commercial introduction of mitral clip. And 161 patients underwent mitral clip. On the other hand, 443 patients underwent open mitral surgery. Among surgical patients, 275 patients had mitral repair, 
while 168 patients had valve replacement. And we evaluated and compared mitral clip with surgical patients about the trend of patient volume, characteristics, and outcomes. I described the patient background in this slide. The breakdown, was this, the breakdown of the study was 69 years old and 60% males. In comparison to surgical treatment group, mitral clip group was older and had more severe heart failure and severe comorbidity. And the SCA score for mitral clip was significantly greater than surgical treatment group. And mitral clip group has more severe MR. On the other hand, surgical treatment group has, has higher rate of mitral stenosis. However, the etiology of MR was no different in both treatment groups. And this graph shows the annual volume per year for each procedure. In 2013, the commercial introduction of mitral clip was approved. Following approval, the number of isolated mitral surgery and all mitral surgery procedure had uh, both had increased during this period. And isolated mitral surgery had been increasing by 50% per year. And all mitral surgery procedure had been increasing by 10% per year. Additionally, there is a significant correlation between mitral clip and the surgical procedure volume. And this slide shows procedure and in-hospital outcomes. Surgical treatment group was associated with lower rate of digital MR and longer length of hospital stay. And procedure success rate was no different in both treatment groups. And in hospital mortality for overall population was 2.2%. And was no different in both treatment groups. Furthermore, the frequency of MI, stroke, and vascular complication were no different in both treatment groups. And survival from all-cause death mortality at 30 days for overall population was 97.5% and was similar for both treatment groups. And freedom from heart failure rehospitalization at 30 days for overall population was 98.3% and was similar for both treatment groups. Additionally, the combined endpoint of death and rehospitalization at 30 days for overall population was 95.9% and was similar for both treatment groups. In conclusion, first, Mitral clip should be introduced into a comprehensive valve center without detection from surgery and with growth in mitral surgical procedure and favorable clinical outcome for treated patients. Second, although mitral clip patients were older and had more severe heart failure and comorbidity, the short-term outcome was similar for post-treatment groups. Therefore, we believe our findings demonstrated the potential benefit of complementary therapy in the treatment of patients with MR. That concludes my presentation.
Thank you for your kind attention. Questions? A wonderful presentation. I just would caution some against your conclusion about the growth in mitral surgical procedures being related to the introduction of the device. There are a lot of clinical changes that could be happening in the practice in terms of growth of valve specialty doctors who are seeing patients or other changes in practice. One could consider what's called the falsification endpoint, where you look at change of other procedures like cabbage okay. and show that cabbage procedures probably haven't changed much over time or would strengthen that conclusion that you've made. Any other questions? Okay. Dr. Tang is up. Oh. Steve Debbie Donna. You know. <laughs> Wait until you're up here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So this is our second score here. Um, Liang is jo um, joining us. Liang Tang um, is joining us from China, and uh, he is an, also an interventional cardiologist. And uh, this is a little bit harder for me. So he is um, from the second. Xianga Hospital of Central South uh, University. He's staying here for two years. He's uh, almost finished with his first year. Um, I think he's also in the uh, midst of like four or five projects. Uh, one is uh, coming to a conclusion here. And I think that's very interesting because we are always wondering um, why some patients do not get aortic valve replacement and what are the reasons. And he and Paul did a very comprehensive analysis of our data set. So congratulations to your hard work and welcome here and thanks for joining us and congratulations to your ACC presentation. Thanks. Morning everyone, thanks for coming. My presentation is contemporary reasons and clinical outcomes for patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis not undergoing aortic valve replacement. Disclosure. I have no conflict of interest to declare. Background. The orthostenosis is the most prevalent valvular heart disease in the Western developed countries. It affects 4% of people over 65 years old and 8% of people over 80 years old. The survival rate of unoperated symptomatic AS is very poor and even worse than that of many advanced malignancies. Transcancers or surgical Aortic valve replacement is the only documented life saving therapy for this patient. However, previous studies have shown that more than 40% of the patients do not undergo AVR procedure. But it is worth noting that almost all this study was performed before the availability of TAVR. So, our study aims to investigate the characteristic clinical outcomes and the contemporary reasons for patients with severe symptomatic AS not undergoing AVR in the era of terror. We aim to gain the insight into the potential barriers to the appropriate care for this patient. Methods. Our study population. All patients were, who were diagnosed with severe AS at the online health system between January 2014 and March 2017 were eligible for analysis. The inclusion criteria is patients diagnosed with severe AS according, according to the ACO, and patients with cardiac symptoms and no AVR or BAV plans, patients without symptoms or those who with prior BAV or AVR was excluded. The clinical presentation demographic comorbidities and the cited reasons for no AVR treatment and the subsequent clinical, clinical outcomes were manually reviewed. The cited reasons for no AVR treatment was determined by a thorough examination of all available clinical documentation. The patient was then divided into two groups. Appropriate group, that means the patients are reasonable candidates for AVR therapy, and the futile group, 
those who likely uh, have no benefits from the AVR procedure. Medical futility was defined as the presence of any of the following comorbidities, such as severe, oh, sorry, such as severe lung and liver disease and uh, end-stage renal disease, or those who own dialysis, and the too rare severe dementia or end-stage malignancies, and any other conditions that's associated with a life expectancy less than one year. The results. During the study period, a total of 548 patients met the inclusion criteria and were included in our study. Among them, 359 belongs to the appropriate group, and the remaining 189 belongs to a futile group. This is the baseline clinical characteristic. As you can see, the futile group patients had more severe symptoms, more comorbidities such as coronary artery disease, peripheral artery disease, and COPD, anemia, and, re and the poor renal function. Then let's focus, let's focus on the appropriate patients. As you can see, nearly 60% of the patients with a class three or four, three or four symptoms, but they not underwent AVR procedure. But when it comes to the surgical risk, as you can see, near 40% patients was belongs to a low STS score. This is the echo data. The futile group patients with a lower uh, ejection fraction. Let's focus on the appropriate group. You can see only 18% of these patients with an ejection fraction less than 40. That is to say, most of these patients with a preserved left ventricular function. Uh, this is the figure show the decision pathway for no AVR treatment. We focus on this group. According to the patient referred by the primary care physician or not, we divided it into two groups. Three patients directly visited to the cardiologist or cardiac surgeon without PCP visit. And 356 patients with a PCP visit. Then you can see 46 patients were not referred to cardiologist or cardiac surgeon for further assessment. Seven patients declined to refer to the cardiologist. After cardiologist visit, uh, 104, 104 patients were not recommended to receive AVR, and another 200 patients was referred, but a few, a few of them were finally declined by the interventional cardiologist or cardiac surgeon, and a lot of people they declined AVR procedure. This is the per proportion of patients seen by the cardiovascular practitioners. Well, this is the, the green, uh, green color represents for the futile group. When compared to the futile group, the appropriate group patients had a lower cardio, cardiology and interven, interventional cardiologist consultation. But there is no, con, no significant difference between the two groups in complete heart team evaluation because we defined the complete heart team evaluation as a discussion by both cardiologist, cardiologist or interventional cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon. This is the cited reasons for no AVR treatment. As you can see, the most, com the most common reason is patient or their family declined, followed by AS incorrectly regarded as not severe. And this is very common in patients with a low low gradient AS. Symptoms not attributed to AS or mild or stable symptoms. This figure show the primary reasons for no AVR therapy. When compared to the futile group, the top four reasons, top four reasons in the appropriate group were more frequently cited. Results. During a follow up, during a mean follow up period of 356 days, a total of 300 patients died, including 162 in the appropriate group 
and 138 in the futile group. There is no significant difference in congestive heart failure rehospitalization between these two groups. This carbon, carbon mile curve shows the survival free of all cause mortality between these two groups. As you can see, the futile group patients had a lower survival free of all cause mortality. And uh, the, as for the combined combined all cause mortality and rehospitalization for heart failure, it shows the same the similar trend. That means the futile group had a higher incidence of this event. After precluding the futile group, we focused on the appropriate group. This couple of mile curve show that the survival free of all cause mortality of appropriate patients stratified by the STS score. As you can see, the, with the STS score increased, the survival rate was decreased significantly. And the, same, the similar trend was observed for the combined survival free of all cause mortality and the rehospitalization of heart failure. In conclusion, our studies show that two thirds of patients with severe symptomatic AS that treated conservatively were appropriate candidates for AVR procedure, and they have had very poor outcomes. The most, the most common reason cited for no AVR treatment is the patient or their family declined, and most patients had an incomplete heart team evaluation and very commonly had symptoms or lesions severely misinterpreted. So further education efforts to address these shortcomings are needed. I, I would, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to Dr. Paul, Maria, and Stephen, John, and Harris for their, for their guidance and very constructive comments for our manuscript. Thanks, thanks Ralph, Dawn, and Aisha for their great help during this study. Thanks for your attention. Questions? Nice presentation. I still have a question regarding the ECHO criteria and it seems like entry into the study had to do with a single grading calculation. Uh, and then, right, and then the, uh, one of the main reasons for not getting surgery was someone misinterpreted that data. So are you, are you saying that the clinical person taking care of the patient ignored this data? Yes, we use the uh, algorithm as if the patient with, uh, so first the patient with the AVA less than one or index is AVA less than 0.6. Uh, if the mean gradient less than 40 or peak velocity less than four, but the DI less than 0 0.25, we included it. We deemed it as a severe AS. But if the patient with a mean gradient larger than 40 or peak velocity larger than four, uh, even the DI larger than the 0.25 will also con consider as a severe AS. Right, so the, the person taking care of the patient ignored that data. Okay, thanks. Okay. Hi, very nicely done. When I look at the dates of the patients you're looking at, the one thing that I remember from patients is they don't want open surgery no matter what. And that may represent a large number of the people who refuse therapy. Yes. Uh, it might be interesting to look at when there's more options for lower risk patients for TAVR, how that kind of data may change. Might be something you describe. That was a great job, congratulations. Thanks. One question, so it looks like more than 2,000 patients had severe AS and actually 75% or more actually did get some therapy, surgery or, or TAVR. Yes. So although we say there's a lot of them who are not, the flip point might be actually the majority of them actually do get what they need, or am I misinterpreting something? Uh, there, 
there is uh, some uncertainty as to that denominator. Um, you know, it's imperfect, and I could actually ask Steve to speak to that. Um, but I, we have struggled with exactly what that denominator is. Um, but the idea was, I think that that captured most of the patients. So uh, if that's true, that that that's positive. But uh, I actually think it's it hasn't been that way because if you look at the annual volumes versus the annual throughput in terms of the single diagnoses, we're actually more around 40 percent in terms of penetrance. Yeah, go ahead. Not along, those, not along those lines, but would you mind going back to your flow chart of how you identified um, what the referral patterns were for the different That's positions? Weird. Keep going. Right there. Because I think this is really the crux of your paper in terms of how you interpret this data. Because I think it's challenging to say that a patient who was referred to a cardiologist and decided not to be referred for, for on a, a discussion for an AVR, that that's necessarily a bad outcome per se because there's probably the lack of clarity in the chart to say that the patient had a discussion with the cardiologist and said, I don't want to go on to this. I'm 92 years old. This isn't consistent with my goals of care. So I think here, there's a real limitation there. So I think really the, the, the ones that I would focus on are the 46 that didn't go on to see a cardiologist or surgeon. And then the question I have there, are those patients who are truly captured within a line of health or were they patients who touch us for an echo but actually get their primary care in a different health system or, or, or really aren't patients that we have the opportunity to care for? So I think you're, 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 you've got a real needle to thread here in terms of the messaging of this paper. Because I, I would disagree that, it, that the important outcome is for all these patients to refer to a so-called heart team if that involves a surgeon, when really you know, many of these patients may have said, I, I have no interest in, in that type of care whatsoever. Um, and you're, you're going to lack that type of clarity. Other things that you might consider looking for is evidence that the patients who didn't go on for a referral were referred for palliative care. Um, if they're not going to receive uh, an intervention, these are patients who have high risk of mortality, as you've demonstrated. And so another important outcome is that they're getting appropriate management of their symptoms towards the end of their life. And obviously that's going to be challenging to find on the chart too, but would help you counter that argument. Because right now this is a very pro-valve paper, which is fine. But I think you need to be cognizant of that argument as you're talking about patients who are approaching 90 years old. Thanks. Nicely done. Um, the conversation uh, with the patient who's considering valve replacement but is concerned is a very delicate and nuanced interaction. I just wonder how well, you know, we've got a large number of cardiologists speaking with the patients. I'm wondering if we um, spend uh, the, um, the same amount of uh, effort trying to educate the patients what their choice, what the implication of their choices are, and um, the um, uh, it it seems to me that um, uh, that if the patients really understood uh, the suffering that might be ahead it, with uh, uh, such an important diagnosis as aortic stenosis, that they might choose differently, and maybe that's um, Maybe that's a pro-valve uh, look at things. Uh, certainly, they have the right to make that choice. There's no question about that. Uh, but, but really being informed. Do we have a sense of what, how those patients did? And we know that they died, but what was their course like? Was there a lot of suffering, a lot of heart failure and disability? Did the families contact us back and say, geez, I wish we had tried harder to um, uh, to get the valve <clears throat> replaced. Thank you. Uh, among patients who refused the uh, AVR therapy, uh, some of them are content with their quality of life, and some of them, I think, they never listen to the cardiologist of the pros and cons of Teva or Sara. They just said, I, w I just want to pursue a conservative treatment. So according, to, according to the notes written by our cardiologist, uh, they usually they just write a sentence, the patients are to do uh, a hospice care or patients are not interested in interventional, uh, interventional treatment. So I, I cannot figure out the exact date of how many patients were discussed by their cardiologist. Uh, with, uh, uh, that means the cardiologist provides the detailed information of Teva or Sarah. I would find it helpful 
to know more about how they did. Because when I counsel a family, I may hold on to a narrative in my head that doesn't reflect the true course of conservative therapy. And I'd love to know what the family thinks about their decision to pursue uh, uh, palliative uh, care and what that looked like, uh, because I hold on to a darker vision that may or may not be true, and um, it would I, it would enrich my ability um, to talk with families if I really knew more about the uh, the refusal of care patients. Liang or Paul, the 102 patients that that the cardiologist that saw the cardiologist but did not get an AVR referral. What what do we know about that? Those those patients, or do we know why? Uh, some of some of the patients where the echo was show a echo discrepancy with the clinical uh, assessment. You know the echo report as a severe AS. But the clinical assessment can uh, usually can regard them as a moderate to severe, and some of them were. Some doctors think that the, the symptoms were stable on medical treatment, and some interesting cases uh, were, for example, Paul and the mother they referred uh, recommend a terror, but about a few months later, another doctor said, "You, are, I think you, your, your symptoms is not so severe enough to put you." Uh, to receive the AVR procedure immediately, immediately. So the reason cited for this for this patient usually was AS show a discrepancy with clinical uh, assessment or symptoms not attributed to AS. For example, some patient with COPD or severe mm -hmm. anemia, it is very difficult to ascertain whether these symptoms were really result from AS or not. Yeah, I think that uh, there were a lot of patients in whom there were um, either misdiagnoses or symptoms not attributable, but it was the minority. And, and the majority, we, we don't really know. And so if you go back to that uh, previous slide there, you know, part of the reason why we, we, we did this paper was because there were two um, things that have changed in the past five years. Uh, the first thing is that the guidelines in 2014 came out, uh, and then those guidelines you know, for the first time, it was a comprehensive discussion about the need for a heart team approach to patients with aortic stenosis. And this paper and this work that Liang shows is that despite those guidelines, and uh, that there really has not been full embracement uh, of the heart team approach, even in our center, which is, I believe, a state-of-the-art center. So that's, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that in the past five years, we all know that TAVR is here, and TAVR is now a relatively safe procedure. So despite guidelines that recommend comprehensive approaches and therapies that are effective and general know-how about how poorly these patients do, this, this, what this paper shows is that we're still not as good as we think we probably can be. And uh, I mean, Monas' comment notwithstanding about majority of patients probably still being treated, I think that's reasonable. But there are still a lot of patients, hundreds of patients, who are ending up in the hospital because they're not being treated appropriately. And I, I think, Mike, to your point, I think we see these patients back. They always come back, and they always complain, and they always end up, I mean, suffering uh, unnecessarily. And I, I think those are some of the messages we're going to work on trying to get through with this, this paper. It seems like, Paul, there's a shift. If there was um, a lot of, just a couple of years ago, we thought the denominator was 8,000, and we, you know, we thought the percent penetration of penetration of the, of effective therapy was, uh, uh, you know, 10 to uh, to 20 percent, and now it looks like it's it's tightening up. Is that just is that real, or is that denominator float that we're still not sure of? We don't know exactly the denominator right now, but my understanding from the dashboard, and Steve can help with that, but it's it, it was around 30% uh, around five years ago, and it ticked up to around 40, and it's back down to around 37%. But you're right, there is about 7,500 patients with severe aortic stenosis in our line of health system right now. And you just do the math, there are 200,000 patients in Alina, 3.5% of that will have AS, 
if you just do the math. So the dashboard is actually pretty accurate, and those numbers are pretty accurate. And that's pulled from the single data. We're not doing 7,500 ABRs here, and, and that's, just, that's just the bottom line. Address the denominator question. There was an issue with the dashboard and the way it was built initially, and in that it included it was based on the guideline definition of severe um, aortic stenosis. The challenge is, is that, as many of our cardiographic readers know, we oftentimes pay inadequate attention to the measurement of the LVOT diameter, and as a result, the reported of an aortic valve area that's just kicked out as a number meets the criteria for aortic stenosis, but the things that we pay attention to in terms of velocity gradients and dimensionless index don't meet criteria, so we'll grade it as moderate, but it'll still have a number that says that it's severe. So when you just automatically query the data and use that number, you'll have half of patients that show up as having aortic stenosis don't in actuality. So you have to be really cognizant about how you de define your automatic queries for severe aortic stenosis. So that's part of the difference. Um, and I just, to come back to the, the, heart, the, the heart team approach, so I, I completely agree with the comprehensive approach, but I think it needs to be careful about a bit of tautology in the sense that we have valve providers who are not surgeons that serve as gatekeepers for who needs to be further referred on to a true heartbeat uh, team approach because they're going to be considered. If they meet with the valve provider and they have a thorough discussion and the, dis the decision is that they do not need to go on or they're not interested, not seeing a surgeon isn't a failure of a heart because that's not appropriate for that patient. So I worry a little bit about this number of 10% only being seen by the heart, valve, uh, the heart team being a bit inflated by the structure in which we triage patients through our system. Any other questions, comments? Wow, great discussion, Liang. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, please stop by and thank Actilian and Vicki Rugemeyer is out there and Portola Pharmaceuticals is Peter Moe. Uh, for sponsoring this week's Brand Rounds. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Have a great week.